Welcome to St. Peter's United Church of Christ, an open and affirming congregation in Carmel, Indiana, where you are welcome to be here, to belong here for who you are and who the Spirit is helping you to become. Whether you're worshiping with us for the first time as a result of some sort of technology viralness, or whether or not you've been here for 20 years or somewhere in between, welcome. My name is Dakota Roberts, Associate Pastor of this congregation joined with Lori Biefenauer, our senior pastor, and we welcome you to this worship service. We are excited to be in this space, but even more so to be in your spaces. Um, we hope it's obvious that the hallways are empty. This is the result of a pandemic reality that we found out that it was really good for our spirits to have some space. And it was really good for all of you on holiday weekends to worship wherever you were. And we found that in fact, when we went online and pre-recorded something, more people came to church than if we opened the doors and were only here at a certain moment on a holiday weekend. So welcome to the grand experiment in worship. It is probably obvious to you that Dakota and I are not in our usual vestments. I would argue this week these feel even more liturgically appropriate. Last week, as Dakota mentioned, we had an experience of his sermon going viral, if you will. It was indeed a sermon on the decision of Roe versus Wade being overturned. And we know that the work that we have to do as a community towards issues of justice is not finished. We also know that the work we have to do as an open and affirming congregation involves love. And so I am sporting my vote t-shirt. Seems appropriate for Independence Day weekend. Mm. Dakota is sporting his brand new St. Peter's You Indeed Are Loved shirt, mm -hmm. which is what we were wearing at our Pride events this Absolutely. year and which show up weekly when we gather together. So grab something comfy. Know that we will be celebrating communion with you wherever you are and that the freedom to worship just as we are with all of our questions and our doubts, with all of our ponderings and our pontifications is what we do. Welcome to St. Peter's United Church of Christ. We indeed are glad that you are here and there and all the spaces in between. I'm going to sing when the Spirit says sing. I'm going to sing when the Spirit says sing. I'm going to sing when the Spirit says sing. I'm going to pray when the Spirit says pray. I'm going to pray when the Spirit says pray. I'm going to pray when the Spirit says pray. And obey the Spirit of the Lord. I'm going to moan when the Spirit says moan. I'm going to moan. shout when the Spirit says shout. I'm gonna shout when the Spirit says shout. I'm gonna shout when the Spirit says shout and obey the Spirit of the Lord. So in recent weeks we have all had so many emotions, so many feelings, so many thoughts, thoughts of what can we possibly do? How does this decision affect me, affect my family, affect those around me in which I'm in community with? So during this time of prayer for transformation, I want you to think about those things. Don't let them overburden you. Don't let them bring you too much worry, but rather bring them and release them. Because the Spirit calls us to transformation. The Spirit calls us to action. It would be easy for us to sit in the worry, to sit in the anger, to sit in the unknown, in the despair. But we are a spirit-led and loved-filled community. 
And we know that the Spirit is calling us to action, action in many forms for each of us. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, temptation surrounds us. Self-preservation lures us to indifference. Fear of confrontation coaxes us to keep silent about things that matter. The desire to be right entices us to ignore the cries of our neighbors. Too often we ignore the call to go and to be in favor of staying stuck in our attitudes and behaviors. Too often we are the ones who refuse to welcome you into our intimate space, who resist the work of transformation, and who remain unresponsive to the burdens of our siblings in creation. Spirit of gentleness, redirect us back, back to the path of life, back to the ways of justice, and back to the hope of peace. Our companion and advocate, take this journey with us. Invite us to make the kingdom of God our dwelling place. Continually renew us, O righteous one, and open the doors that ease us into the entry of new life new mercy, and new grace. Amen. Second Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the ruler of Aram. He was a great officer and highly esteemed. It was at Naaman's hand that God gave a victory to Aram. He was a mighty warrior and he had leprosy. On one of their raids, the Arameans captured a young woman who was an Israelite. She served Naaman's wife. One day, she said to her mistress, If only Naaman would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure Naaman's leprosy. Naaman went to the ruler and told him what the Israelite woman said. By all means, go, the ruler replied. I will send a letter to the ruler of Israel. So Naaman left taking ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the ruler of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my attendant Naaman to you, so that he may cure him of leprosy. As soon as the ruler of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a fight with me? Then Elijah, the prophet of God, learned that the ruler of Israel tore his robes. He sent a message to the ruler. Why did you tear your robes? Have Naaman come to me, and he will learn that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elijah's house. Elijah sent a messenger to say to the warrior, Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand there before me, calling on the name Yahweh, and wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than any of the waters of Israel? Could I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went away in rage. Naaman's attendants went to him, saying, Sir, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you have not done it? How much more, then, when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the prophet of God told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of youth. Our focus this week is connection in our season of gratitude. And that scripture really, really played into the idea of connection for me, so much so that I came to one of the places that I feel most connected uh, in the middle of filming, and that is in a tree. 
there is a way in which we are connected to nature, in which we have the freedom to express ourselves and our faith with all of creation around us. And that was seen in today's story with Naaman, where he is told to go to the river, to go to those waters of life, to have life restored. But it's more than just a story about nature. It's a story, maybe unfortunately, about pride and power and how those things can be a little corrupting. Let me say a little bit more about that. I don't have a huge sermon planned, just a few thoughts that I think can guide us as our week continues following this holiday. And here's where my thoughts sort of begin and end. This is a story of surprises. It's the servants that actually cause the change. They're the ones that take the risk and say, hey, you should go see this person to be cured of your leprosy. Now, let me take a pause here and say, this is not a story intended to say that if you just try hard enough or you do the right things, whatever ailment or chronic illness or challenge you have will be healed or solved or fixed. It's not what the story is about, and it's been used too many times in that way. What the story is about, I think, is the change in Naaman. So the servants come and say, hey, you got to go to this person. And he does do that. And then it's not good enough. His pride gets in the way. And he says, I wish Elisha would have come out and would have greeted me with all of this fanfare. And it's the servants again who say, are you saying that if he asked you to do something big, you would do it, but because he's asking you to do something small, you won't? And then, right at the end of the passage, is when we learn that Naaman goes into the river and was healed. We don't know what changed for Naaman. We don't know what got to him. What we know is that he chose to do the thing that he was asked and what could be perceived as the simple thing. Again, this doesn't mean that everything is, is healed with a simple action. But I do think that this story points to the idea of being connected. Being connected to ones that might surprise you, like the servants. Being connected to your own pridefulness, like Naaman was, not willing to do the smaller thing. Being connected to your own power, realizing that sometimes doing the smallest of things can make a huge change. I'm looking at the world today. I'm looking at the way in which people are responding to one another. And I'm realizing that the problems and the challenges feel big and they feel disconnected. Are the environmental concerns connected to the concerns about gun violence? Are they connected to the concerns about abortion access and health care rights? Are those connected to concerns about, well, you name it. The lists go on and on and on. And at some point it feels too big. And I wonder if what this story is supposed to do for us is to remind us that the small connections matter. What changed Naaman was a connection, a relationship with a servant and a willingness, a connection to his own spirit to change the way he saw things. Perhaps we are being called to do the same. Perhaps we need to focus on the little things that actually become pretty big. Maybe it's a little letter that you write. Maybe it's a little phone call that you've been needing to make. Maybe it's a little bit of showing up. Maybe it's just a little bit of silence. All of those little things bring us to new ways of connecting to one another and to the sacred. And that is what matters. Naaman. Maybe more importantly, the servants. They taught us that this week. I think the tree is teaching us that as well. That there are so many ways to be connected, to branch out, to dig deep with our roots, and to offer shelter for those who need it most. 
sometimes, especially when we're feeling depleted, we are the ones who need the shelter. So in this particular week of holiday, a week in which we celebrate and honor freedom, a week in which some are struggling and others are beyond joyful, let's remember to take a page out of Naaman's book. Listen to the ones who are not often heard and trust that maybe, maybe the smallest of actions will make a huge difference. God, in your many names, may it be so. Amen. From the sacredness of scripture to the holiness of song, we do indeed see the living Christ and we see the sacred in one another. For the rest of our summer of gratitude, our prayer station where I am standing now is going to be covered with note cards and envelopes. Prayer is sending a note to another. It's a journey in which we share who we are, who we are becoming, and what we need with each other. And so we encourage you when you are able, whether it's with paper back home, a note from your office, or if you come back here and grab a note or six, I promise we won't run out. Make this your prayer and send it to someone who needs it. In a spirit of connection, in a spirit of praying our way through a journey of many uncertainties, let us take this time to connect with one another through prayer. It is the labyrinth, a sacred walk or a sacred tracing that will lead our way. As we begin our journey in prayer, we trust 
that our feet are on holy ground, that our bodies are containers for the sacred, and that even when they wander, our minds are full of prayers. We travel this labyrinth illuminated by a candle which proclaims love for all. Perhaps we even close our eyes knowing that the path will make its way known. And we settle in, trusting that the way to the center is also the way to a beginning and an ending and back again. God be with us in the twists and the turns, the painful realities, the times in which we are desperate for a road map, and maybe most of all, the times when we are so certain we cannot hear another beloved's voice. As we make our way with one another and with you, help us to trust and to receive the blessing of prayer. Blessed are you who bear the light in unbearable times, who testify to its endurance amid the unendurable, who bear witness to its persistence when everything seems in shadow and grief. Blessed are you in whom the light lives in whom the brightness blazes, your heart a chapel, an altar where in the deep of night it can be seen. The fire that shines forth in you in unaccountable faith, in stubborn hope, in love that illumines every broken thing it finds. Blessed are the prayers of our hearts. Blessed are the lingering regrets. Blessed is the righteous anger, the unspeakable joy. Blessed are the journeys of healing and trusting and giving and receiving. God, take us to another way. And welcome the words of our voices united, powerful words of hope, of remembrance, of life, of choice. Our Creator God, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. As we come to this time of generosity, this season of gratitude that we're in, we give gratitude for all of our blessings, blessings that we share with others and share with our community. Because as a connected community, a spirit-led community, we know that there is joy to be found in the gift of giving and in the gift of receiving. So 
if you're so inspired, whether you have been here for years and have pledged your heart out, whether you continue to give of your time, talent, and treasure, or whether you're joining us for the first time and you feel inspired by the Spirit, we invite you to give of your offerings and your tithes. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for these gifts that people have brought from near and from far for the purposes of your kingdom, for that justice realized in this lifetime, for the work of the Spirit. May it all be stewarded for your purposes with responsibility and with love. We give you all of the praise and all of the thanks, God of abundance and connection. Amen. So we find ourselves in another sacred space here at St. Peter's, one of the most active spaces, and a space that is home to a whole lot of leftovers. So there are birthday cupcakes and pride candy and even dog biscuits from uh, a few events. And we encourage you to look around your own sacred space. Know that the messiness is a part of communion. We don't believe that Jesus was eating at a perfectly set table, but rather that the stuff of life was right there. And so take a moment, trust that whatever you have is what you need to be connected, to be a part of this sacred meal, to be seen by God, and by this community, perhaps most importantly, see yourself as one who matters, as one whose presence at the table is absolutely necessary. I imagine that's what Jesus said when he looked at his friends when he looked at the meal before them, when he blessed the bread and the cup and the gathering. So God be with us in these spaces, some of them as mundane as they are, others feeling absolutely special on a holiday weekend. Be in these spaces in the things that we will eat and the things we will drink and absolutely in the spaces in between. Gift us with the surprise of Holy Communion as we gather in many spaces and many times, but always as one. Remembering back to that night when Jesus ate with his friends, he took a loaf of bread, blessed it, and broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you as often as you eat it. Remember me. And in a similar fashion, after supper, Jesus took a cup, and he poured into it, and he blessed it, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant 
a covenant of promise and connection of love and of the Spirit for all of you. Each time that you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me and my teachings. Ministering in the name of Jesus, we invite you to receive these sacred elements for all, given for all, and received by all who are willing. Mm. Dakota, the bread of life given for you. Thank you. Glory, the bread of life and the cup of blessing given for you. Amen. Let us pray. Bountiful God, we give you thanks that you have refreshed us at your table. We give you thanks that you put no barriers in front of this table for us, O God, that all who come, who thirst, and who hunger for a relationship with you will know it at this table and at the tables in which we find ourselves. We give you thanks for the power of connection that allows us to be a community that expresses love and joy and hurt and peace and justice. In your many names we pray. Amen. Amen. So as we go from this place, from the many places in which we find ourselves, we go knowing that we are connected to one another through the Spirit. We know that we are connected as a St. Peter's community, a community that loves and welcomes all, and we know that we go forth into the world to be active, not to just settle for what is, because we know what can be. So choose your t-shirt wisely. Remember your power, remember your pride, and trust that it is our responsibility to open doors for others in a spirit of independence and freedom and love for all. Go in peace.